Hi everyone, welcome to The Enthusiastic Buddhist. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about the Four Noble Truths and I'll briefly introduce the Noble Eightfold Path. These are considered to be the very core of the Buddha's teachings and fundamental to all the different schools of Buddhism. After the Buddha gained enlightenment in Bodhgaya in India, he walked to Sarnath in Varanasi where he met with the five meditators he'd previously practiced with. It was these five men who had the very good fortune to receive the first sermon that the Buddha ever gave. And the first teachings the Buddha spoke on was the Four Noble Truths. Now the first Noble Truth is the truth of Dukkha. Dukkha is a Pali word that can be translated as suffering or dissatisfaction. In this first Noble Truth, the Buddha said, Suffering as a noble truth is this, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering, association with the loathed is suffering, dissociation from the loved is suffering, not to get what one wants is suffering. In short, suffering is the five categories of clinging objects. So what the Buddha is saying is that to live means to also experience suffering or dissatisfaction at some point in our lives. He wasn't saying that our lives are thoroughly depressing and all we experience is suffering, so therefore we should just pray for an early death. Instead, in the First Noble Truth, the Buddha is simply highlighting a, a fundamental truth about our existence and one we might have overlooked or one we might have been in some denial of. I mean, we're all seekers of happiness, so it's sometimes difficult to accept that life is really a mixture of pleasure and pain. The Buddha is just waking us up to this fact and telling us not to be so surprised when we do experience suffering or unease. It really shouldn't come as such a shock. And if we are suffering, we shouldn't take it personally and think that we've made the wrong move. You know, we shouldn't blame ourselves and think that we chose the wrong partner, the wrong career or something like that. Suffering or dissatisfaction is just a natural part of our human existence and knowing this should actually bring some relief because it means we can relax even in times of great difficulty because with time suffering or dissatisfaction will pass and change into happiness again. And fortunately, the Buddha didn't stop at the first noble truth and say, uh, yep, you're all going to have to experience suffering. That's it. See you later, guys. <laughs> Instead, he also taught the second, third and fourth noble truth, which were to diagnose why we suffer and explain how we can become free of all sufferings completely forever and the steps we need to take to get there. Now I want to look at the First Noble Truth in a bit of detail before we move on to the others. The Buddha was a lot like a doctor. He carefully looked at our situation and examined all our problems first. In the First Noble Truth, the Buddha really dissects our suffering and reveals that everyone, no matter who they are, will experience these particular types of suffering. And we can look at these one by one and investigate the truth for ourselves. So the first one is that birth is suffering. Well, we only have to see that at birth, both the mother and child are usually in a lot of discomfort, to say the least. The baby is being squeezed out of this very narrow opening that's probably very unpleasant. And coming out of its nice liquidy placenta, the baby is subjected to many experiences that would probably seem very harsh and painful at first. Now, of course, there's great joy in that, that accompanies the birth of a baby, right? Well, the Buddha never denied that there was also happiness in our life. He was just pointing to the truth that suffering exists as well in these events in particular. The next one is aging is suffering. So most of us are going to experience the suffering first when our parents or grandparents start to age. On a personal note, in June this year, uh, my mother, who leads a life busier than most 20 year olds I know, had a series of strokes uh, which left her in hospital for six weeks while she tried to learn to walk again. And I can tell you that no one in my family who was having much fun during those six weeks, it was terrible suffering for all of us. 
But fortunately, she's back home and, and she's doing well now. But not only are we going to experience the suffering of old age as our loved ones start to age, we're also going to experience the suffering of ageing firsthand as we, as we lose our youth, our beauty, our energy and our abilities. I mean, in terms of beauty, the cosmetic industry is never going to go broke because all of us women are desperately trying to stay young and look beautiful. And you can't say that this desperation is, is not some form of suffering. The next one, sickness is suffering. Now, unless you have a job that you hate or a school that you don't want to go to, uh, I don't recall anyone ever saying that they enjoy being sick. Everyone hates being sick. Whether it's a small cold or something serious like cancer, sickness is suffering and nobody wants it. Death is suffering. Death may sometimes be a relief from certain suffering, for instance, if the person's in a lot of pain, but then there's still the grief and the suffering of those who are left behind. Sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. Well, I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Association with the loathed is suffering. For instance, when we're having to spend time with people we don't get along with, or be in a place or environment that we don't like. These are forms of suffering because we want to be elsewhere or with different people. Dissociation from the loved is suffering. For example, if we have to be separated from our loved ones by death or by distance because one of us is traveling, we miss them and we suffer because of this. Not to get what one wants is suffering. Surely we can all understand this one. Not getting what we want usually makes us frustrated, angry and depressed even. It doesn't even have to be something so important that we want. It could be as simple as going to our local grocery store and not being able to buy the type of milk that we want. Or we wear something nice in the hope of getting attention and praise but nobody notices and compliments us so we suffer. Or we move to another city for a new start, but we still don't find the happiness we're hoping for, and again, we suffer. These are just some examples of this type of suffering. Now, these examples of old age sickness and death, you could say that the Buddha used these to highlight that suffering is part of our life. But he wasn't saying that suffering is restricted to only these experiences. It may be hard for us to fathom at first, but feeling dis dissatisfied is a common bond that we all share, no matter who we are. Whether we're rich, poor, famous, ordinary, beautiful or ugly, no one is completely satisfied with their present experience. We're all constantly looking for something more or something different. Even if we aren't suffering from the main forms of suffering, like sickness, old age and death, we still suffer from our dissatisfaction with the present moment. For instance, there's the suffering of relationships. You know, we might suffer because we want one, but we don't have one. Or even when we're in a relationship, we're, you know, we're also not satisfied. <laughs> then there's the suffering of employment. You know, we suffer if we don't have a job. And even if we have a job, we're dissatisfied with our, our work or our colleagues. <laughs> Then there is even the suffering of wanting the weather to be different. <laughs> Everything we experience seems to be tinged with this underlying suffering or dissatisfaction. And our dissatisfaction then manifests in us trying to accumulate more or improve on what we have. For instance, we're not happy, so we go shopping for more clothes or we try to exercise to get a big, better figure or organise a trip away with our partner. All these activities are motivated by the wish to find some everlasting satisfaction and happiness. And we live our lives plagued with a constant feeling that true lasting happiness always seems to be one step ahead of us. We seem to believe things like, oh, once I get married, then I'll be happy. Or once I pay off my mortgage, then I'll be happy. Or once I retire, then I'll be happy. <laughs> And we all have these or similar beliefs. So we keep striving towards this goal of happiness somewhere in the future. 
Meanwhile, we're never satisfied with what we have in the present moment. So because of this dissatisfaction, we suffer. And you'll notice that if you took a, take a look around, that everyone is doing this. Everyone has this belief that happiness is out there and attainable. But if you look around, you'll see that no one is really 100% happy. So the Buddha then went on to explain the reason why everything we experience is tinged with this dissatisfaction. He taught the second noble truth, which was the noble truth, truth of the origin of dukkha, the origin of suffering or dissatisfaction. The Buddha explained to us that dissatisfaction or suffering arises not because that there's something wrong with the things out there, it's because of our own mental state that we suffer. Our unsatisfactory experiences come from three main causes, our mental craving, aversion and ignorance. But, prim but primarily, he says here that it's because of our craving. He said, the origin of suffering as a noble truth is this, it is the craving that produces renewal of being, accompanied by enjoyment and lust, and enjoying this and that. In other words, craving for sensual desires, craving for being, craving for non-being. Craving here means our desire, greed or wanting. In Pali the word used is tanha, which means thirst. So thirst, craving for what we want, craving to get rid of what we don't want, craving to be someone or somebody, for instance trying to live up to our own concepts of who we are or what others or what we want others to think of us. All this craving leads to dissatisfaction and suffering. Each and every one of us is caught up in this game and we're so involved in it that we can't see it. We're always trying to arrange our lives in a way that is pleasant and happy to us. But no matter what, we're never 100% happy because we're, con we're constantly craving for more materially, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And because of this, we experience pain. We might want to be more attractive, have more money, more friends, have a better job, have better relations with our in-laws, in or we want to, more excitement in our lives. We expend so much energy on trying to acquire these things, but we never seem to reach the point where we can sit back and say, that's it, this is happiness, I don't need anything more. In fact, craving is endless, so much so that people are still craving for something else when they breathe their last breath. So it's this endless craving and desire which is the primary reason for our dissatisfaction. Also, our cra craving, we have the craving of wanting permanency or stability, and that's only going to lead to disappointment as well because there's nothing, no object, no person, no phenomena that can ever remain permanent. So unless we come to understand that everything is impermanent and unreliable, we suffer because of our desire, because our desire doesn't match reality. One way we can identify what our cravings are is to also take a look at our expectations. Craving usually manifests as expectations. For instance, we might expect our partners to act a, a certain way in a certain situation. So we're craving for this. And if we don't get it, we're angry and upset, and ultimately, we suffer. Now, fortunately, the Buddha didn't stop at the second noble truth. He went on to explain the third noble truth, which is the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha. So there is an alternative. We can completely rid ourselves of this dissatisfaction. Suffering can be extinguished if we remove its cause. The Buddha said, cessation of suffering as a noble, noble truth is this. It is remainderless, fading and ceasing, giving up, relinquishing, letting go and rejecting of that same craving. So if we can let go of craving, then we can extinguish our suffering. This is fantastic news. It's not all morbid. It's not all doom and gloom. There is an end to suffering. There is a way to end dukkha, to end this fire of craving and the rolling sea of emotions that usually accompanies it. What a relief! <laughs> and the secret is to let go of our craving. 
if there if there was ever a Buddhist motto, it would be two words: <laughs> let go. The analogy used often is that the cessation of dukkha is like a fire being put out, that the burning has ceased. And this burning is really a mental burning, this burning of the mind that continues to crave and not find satisfaction in the present moment. But to extinguish this craving that causes so much suffering in our minds, we need to train our minds in a different way. So it was in the fourth noble truth that the Buddha taught the truth of the path leading to the cessation of dukkha, which explains exactly how we start on the path of releasing us from our craving and dissatisfaction. The Buddha said, the way leading to cessation of suffering as a noble truth is this, it is simply the noble eightfold path that is to say, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. The Buddha taught that by learning to use our three doors of our body, speech and mind skillfully, it would lead to present and future happiness, especially by learning to refrain from unskillful actions of our body, speech and mind, it would remove so much unnecessary suffering. So by controlling our body, speech and mind in ways that help others um, instead of harming them and by generating wisdom in our minds, we can end suffering. Therefore, true happiness is achievable through personal endeavour. Now, I'll be going over the Noble Eightfold Path in more detail in future videos. Meanwhile, there are some great articles and free e-books that I highly recommend that you, that you read. I'll put links to these on my website, enthusiasticbuddhist.com. I just want to quickly mention that some cravings in life are actually helpful and indeed encouraged. These are cravings to live a life of virtue and non-violence, wanting to meditate, to have peace and discover who we truly are. These are considered wholesome cravings that we shouldn't be trying to eliminate as they are necessary in the beginning of any spiritual path. And we shouldn't fear that our life would be boring, uninteresting or nothing without craving. We can still live in the world and make plans for the future without craving. You just wouldn't have all your happiness contingent on achieving a particular goal. You could actually be bountifully happy right now. In fact, a person free of craving is said to experience the greatest happiness, peace and bliss in their body and mind because they're fully present in the moment and they have no need for anything else. Their life isn't boring and bland. In fact, everything is new and all their actions is free and spontaneous because they aren't worried about meeting the expectations of others. So having a life free of craving is not something to be feared, but something to aspire to. So what cravings can we identify in our lives that might be causing us un unnecessary suffering? What cravings do we need to let go of? It might be our craving for our partner or child to be different from who they are, or our craving to be the next millionaire. <laughs> I know my craving of wanting to see everyone just get along is something out of my control and something I need to let go of to have some peace of mind. Or my craving for my parents to live forever is a big one that I'm constantly having to drop. So what, what cravings can you see in your mind? We all have them, whether, we're whether they're obvious to us or not. So anyway, that's all from me for now. Please subscribe to my channel for future videos. Please like and share this video if you found it helpful. So have a lovely week everyone and I hope to see you in the next video.